All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Richard Morrison, a research fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the author of the recent study, Environmental, Social and Governance Theory, Diffusing a Major Threat to Shareholder Rights. This is the future of environmental, social and governance investing, a policy panel uh, on what we can expect to see in the coming months and perhaps years from Securities and Exchange Commission, the finance industry and other policymakers and stakeholders. Our panelists today are uh, Andrew Stutterford, editor of National Review's Capital Matters Initiative, Justin Danoff, director of the Free, Inter uh, the Free Enterprise Project at the National Center for Public Policy Research, and Jennifer Schultz, director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. So each of our three panelists are going to give their own introductory remarks about the angles of the issue that they find most important, uh, but I'll start off with a few general observations about where we are in regards to ESG theory and practice right now. So the current leadership of the Securities and Exchange Commission is poised to propose new rules that would regulate climate disclosure by public companies and likely a wider a array of ESG related topics as well. We don't know what those rules will look like yet because they haven't been proposed, but on March 15th, then acting chair, Alison Heron Lee published a list of 15 questions for public comment, which suggested that the commission was considering a range of options. Uh, many industry observers wrote insightful comment letters in response, uh, including some of the people participating in the event today. And uh, those comments are well worth perusing. Uh, we'll include a link to some of those in our follow-up email. When the SEC does roll out its eventual proposed rulemaking, it will almost certainly be the biggest development in the area in over a decade. Uh, Comparing, compared to uh, the climate disclosure guidance the SEC issued in 2010. Uh, the agency has already assembled a 22 member task force within the enforcement division to quote, proactively identify ESG related misconduct. Uh, that's just under existing rules. Uh, and any new rules of course would ban the SEC's purview for enforcement significantly. In a speech on June 23rd, Chairman Gary Gensler said that he's asked the staff to put together recommendations for mandatory climate disclosures on mandatory risk disclosure on climate risk and human capital. He's also asked for recommendations on governance, strategy, and risk management related to climate. Uh, and finally, also, he's asked the staff to consider ways that funds are marketing themselves to investors as sustainable or green or ESG uh, and the factors that undergird those claims. So many ESG advocates have recently suggested that with new SEC action on the horizon, this is finally the time that companies that have been holding back will now be required to jump into the quote, responsible investing world with both feet. As with the creation of the enforcement division task force, however, uh, what we're hearing suggests that there is at least as much risk for companies that have already embraced ESG language and metrics as those who have so far declined to do so. There doesn't seem to be, at least at this early stage, any enthusiasm for holding early movers harmless as a reward for having stepped forward first. We've also seen movement on the side of voluntary guidelines. One of the most frequent complaints from public firms is there are too many competing ESG frameworks uh, and that they're asked to comply with multiple time consuming requests for information. Uh, at least some people uh, seem to have been uh, listening, as we saw the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board and the International Integrated Reporting Council uh, merge into a new body this year, Values Reporting Foundation. They have uh, also made public pledges on harmonizing their recommendations. With similar organizations like the Global Reporting Initiative, uh, although we should note that there's nothing stopping yet new stakeholders from creating yet more groups where the others have merged. Finally, asset managers, advisors, uh, accounting firms, and their consultants uh, continue launching new products and practices under the ESG banner. Uh, BlackRock announced last month a new partnership uh, with uh, Beringa Partners on climate change modeling. Uh, and uh, in what seems to me to be the biggest announcement in recent months, uh, accounting powerhouse PwC uh, said that they would add 100,000 new employees in the next five years quote, aimed at helping its clients grapple with climate and diversity reporting. Not in the whole industry, not just with consultants and not just among accountants, 
100,000 people in one firm in five years. Uh, that's quite something. Now with that, I will uh, I'll happily hand off uh, to uh, our first panelist, uh, Andrew Studdard. Andrew. Uh, thank you, uh, Richard. It's very good. To, it's very good to be here, and um, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, speak. I'm um, just uh, very briefly, just a couple of minutes. Um, my, I, as, as you said at the beginning, I am editor of uh, National Review's uh, Capital Matters, which focuses on economics, finance, and business. Um, but prior to joining uh, National Review, uh, about just over a year ago, I worked in the, uh, well, I'm qualified as a, I'm, I'm a lawyer by training in the UK, and then I worked in finance for the next uh, nearly 40 years. And, um, and, and my sort of focus was on uh, equities. And um, I began to notice uh, in the last few years of my uh, career, and I worked for a European firm that based in New York, um, that there was my colleagues over in Europe were occasionally holding these socially responsible, what they called socially responsible investment uh, conferences, SRI. Um, I, I, I looked at it, um, thought, well, this looks like nonsense, but obviously passed on the invitation to my client base, which was institutional here in the US, and said, any interest in showing up? And the answer was no. Um, then in the last year or so, one began to hear about ESG. Uh, people started um, talking about ESG, both from my client side, not normally it has to be said on a complimentary, in a complimentary way, um, but also um, on the sell side, which is where I was based. Um, we started writing reports on ESG. Uh, I looked at it, I didn't think of the G for me has always been relatively fine actually, but the E and the S seems had to have little to do with investment return. And speaking to quite a few of the analysts, um, they didn't say much, but they didn't disagree much either. Um, so, and then I move over to, Na to, to National Review, where I've been writing freelance for decades. And um, here we are, and the ESG has become one of our big areas of focus. And I think that, um, to put it at its simplest, um, this is about the future, not the past. But I think to understand the future, we have to understand the past. And I think that we have to understand that what it is, is essentially a threat to property rights um, because an attack on shareholder primacy is nothing more or less than an attack on property rights. But more than that, and perhaps more seriously, uh, it is also a threat to democracy because what it is about is saying that how we decide how does society will be run will be governed by a coterie of essentially corporate oligarchs, investment oligarchs, regulators, media people, and activists, none of which are actually invest, uh, none of which are and regulators, none of which are directly elected. So there won't be much room for you or me as, as voters to have much of a say what goes on. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Uh, do, I do think that there, uh, all I've got to say is this is not going away. I mean, did what, just from what Richard was saying just now, the March the 15th, this, the bandwagon is underway, not least because people in Wall Street, and believe you me on this, uh, see this as a good way of making money. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and I would like to uh, remind our uh, viewers that they can submit their questions uh, either via the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, or they can email those to uh, events at cpi.org. We're monitoring that box. Uh, so uh, moving on, next we have uh, Jennifer. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's great to be here today. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, again, I'm Jennifer Schulp. I'm the Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Um, I've been with Cato for about a year now, and prior to that, I was a regulatory enforcement lawyer at FINRA. Um, so I tend to approach all of these issues, first and foremost, from a legal perspective and from an enforcement perspective. So that's where I'll start. I mean, I think Richard covered a lot of the points that I think are really salient here. Um, we're talking about the future of ESG investing today, but some of that future is, is already here. 
uh, companies are voluntarily providing a wide range of corporate disclosures on E, S, and G. Um, and G, I think, is a little bit different, but specifically on E and S. There's a wide range of new products out there that are drawing a significant amount of investment money um, covering, again, every aspect of E and S that you can imagine, um, in part because E and S are not uniformly defined or uniformly un understood to cover any certain areas. And there are a wide range of service providers who have gotten in on the ESG movement, um, ratings agencies, uh, accountants, um, standard setters. And there is a, a large business here and a large business that is looking to make money off of this area. Uh, the question for me, though, is, you know, what is the government's role here? And that's particularly where the Biden administration comes in. Um, they came in very hot, uh, saying that, that there is an important role for the SEC and the government to play in ESG investing. And even before Gary Gensler was confirmed as the chair of the SEC, the SEC made clear that ESG, however you ultimately define it, is going to be a priority. Um, reviewing the climate change related disclosure from 2010, the SEC's exam priorities include a greater focus on climate risks and they created the ESG task force within the, the division of enforcement. I think we should expect cases uh, if for no other reason than to justify the existence of this task force and to um, uphold the administration's priorities. I think it's important to note though, um, as the SEC Republican commissioners noted that, that there are rules that currently exist that can support some of these types of cases, um, particularly in the asset management space where we're looking at um, disclosures to investors about ESG strategies and whether or not those uh, asset managers are investing as disclosed, um, and also uh, whether companies are complying with the um, current disclosure and the 2010 guidance about that disclosure in the climate change space. I have no doubt that the SEC will find violations now that they're looking for them, and some of those violations are not necessarily going to be supported by any sort of novel theory. Um, they'll be the type of cases that prior administrations could have brought had they been so inclined. But this is all just a prelude to the SEC looking to make big changes in this space. And that's first and foremost in the climate change disclosure space. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons that the SEC should not be doing that. And I'm sure we're going to talk a lot about that today. So I, I won't waste my, my brief time here um, touching on all of those. But, but we expect to see a climate change rule disclosure as early as October. And I think uh, we will certainly see it before the end of the year. Um, given the wide range of comments that the SEC got in response to um, then acting chair Lee's request for comment in this space, I think the SEC is, is rushing it. And I think we're going to see that in what they put out. Uh, and I think that moving forward past um, climate change into kind of these human capital areas, um, diversity uh, and other areas, I think we're going to, again, suffer from, from haste here, um, in addition to um, suffering from looking at expanding the SEC's authority and mandate here far beyond where it is and where it should be. Um, say exciting times for some, uh, very scary times, I think, um, as, we're, as we're looking forward. Um, thanks. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, and now to uh, our, our third panelist, Justin Denoff. Thank you, Richard. Um, I appreciate the opportunity and thanks to the Competitive Enterprise Institute for focusing on this topic. It's a wildly important topic that's not talked about enough. Um, and I, I like to reorient folks um, just, to, just to take a step back. We're a shareholder activist organization, the Free Enterprise Project. We have been fighting woke capitalism since before it was invented as a term in 2016 by Ross Douthout in the New York Times. Um, so we invest in companies 
to try and be a voice for right of center investors. Because a couple of years ago, we kind of peeled back the layers of the onion and wondered why so many American corporations seem to be aligned with the political left on what back then was corporate social responsibility or SRI, which now falls under the banner of ESG. And we realized that liberal affinity groups from unions to PETA to Greenpeace to actual asset managers and um, like left wing states pension funds like New York and California were all invading this space to invest in corporate America to push what are now known as ESG policies. So we've been doing this for 12 years now and we're kind of been inside the belly of the beast watching this happen. And what is it? It's a name and shame game, right? So when we're talking about you know, the SEC potentially asking companies to report on their ESG metrics, that's setting a marker. And if you're not on the right side of the marker, then you're going to be shamed to moving your corporate action. So if your board, for example, isn't diverse enough, you're going to have to change the, you know, human capital structure of your board of directors, right? And so that's what the SEC is getting engaged in. And that's what's very scary here, because as we've seen it, ESG markers laid out, and Jennifer, you know, explained this quite well, there's ESG rating systems everywhere. You know, Bloomberg, Institutional Shareholder Services, any number of ESG rating systems are already out there. Um, and they're largely a scam, right? Again, it's a name and shame. And who's the biggest scam artist in history? The American federal government. So we don't wanna give that power over to them. What the SEC standard should be and has been and should remain is material. That is what information is material to me as an investor in this company. And the construct of the board of directors skin surface characteristics, that's not important to me. Whether we pledge to be carbon neutral by 2035 is not important to me. But that's what the SEC is setting down the road to do. And that's what we all need to keep you know, our eye on the ball with what they're doing because the Biden administration, Jennifer's right, they're going very quickly. Um, not only with the SEC, the Department of Labor under the Trump administration uh, promulgated some great rules uh, that told investment managers uh, in private pension funds, for example, that they needed to focus on pecuniary interests, not environment, social and governance interests. Immediately, the Biden administration announced they weren't going to enforce that. Same with proxy voting, right? They, they said to fund managers, you, you, you can't be voting on all of these resolutions if they're not in the best interest of your clients. Um, and we, you know, at the Free Enterprise Project, believe me, we know where these shareholder resolutions come from. We know the organizations behind them and their filing, and they have no interest in the financial performance of corporations. They are trying to social engineer through their resolutions. And so again, the Trump administration was great on this. Biden administration immediately came out and said, we're not going to enforce it. So on all areas and, and, and the Congress, right? Congress in, in last, last month passed, I had to write it down because it's such pablum, the Corporate Governance Improvement and Investor Protection Act. Nonsense. It's, it's basically an AOC Elizabeth Warren um, view of capitalism, which is a dim view of capitalism. So that's, that's where the current um, Capitol Hill and Biden administration are moving. And that's why this conversation is so important. All right, Justin, thank you very much. So we have, uh, I've got my own questions, of course, but we've already got uh, questions pouring in uh, from uh, our viewers. So uh, there's uh, one that I think since we've, uh, we ourselves have brought this up, I think is an important uh, process question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Anthony Conte. Uh, does it do any good for individuals to submit comments to the SEC on its proposals? Uh, and if so, uh, how do you do that? Um, my, my quick response is uh, yes, uh, it does, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one, uh, we can optimistically hope that the staff of the SEC are in fact uh, reading them and taking them seriously. Uh, but they're also useful as uh, public statements. You know, uh, Groups like CEI do uh, public coalition letters all the time. Um, that puts our position forward um, in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, full of uh, citations and, uh, and sources and evidence uh, backing it up. So it's a, it's a much uh, wonkier version of a, you know, persuasive writing piece like an op-ed. 
um, that can be uh, you know, shared with people obviously outside the SEC as well. Um, uh, the, when it comes to any particular uh, proceeding, the, the one that we've talked about before, March 15th, was a little unusual uh, because it was a sort of open-ended request for comment. Usually these things are uh, part of what we call the notice and comment process of proposing a new regulation. So you will get uh, a notice of proposed, proposed rulemaking from an agency, then they will be required to accept comments for a certain period of time and then consider them uh, theoretically before uh, issuing a, uh, a regulation. Um, so this most recent one that we've discussed is a little bit different from that because there wasn't actually a proposal. It was just a request for people to comment on it in general. Um, but uh, if anyone else would like to, uh, to chime in about why, why agency comments might be useful. No, I'd, I'd love to actually, because this in particular, I think presents a good opportunity to have an agency comment. Um, when Gary Gensler was doing his uh, confirmation hearing, he had said several times something along the lines that, that they're interested in what investors want. And his definition of materiality uh, basically came down to if investors want it, the SEC should be requiring it. So I've been calling this kind of to myself that he's crowdsourcing company disclosures. And in these circumstances, when you look through the comments that have been sent, you see a lot of people that have money to spend on hiring lawyers um, to write comments. One of the reasons they have money to spend is because they're going to make money off of disclosure requirements. And I think what was lacking and will continue to lack in almost any SEC comment file is commentary from individual investors who are making investment decisions. Um, and I think contrary comments to the, the, the administration's train of thought are always valuable, but those comments I think are particularly valuable here where the interest is in what investors want. And there's not a lot of good research out there to show what investors are supposedly demanding here. So if the SEC is going to crowdsource, they should hear from the crowd. Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a good soundbite. I might I have to steal that at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I mean, I, the, 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 I think it is important that people uh, have their say with the SEC. And I think one of the reasons that it's important is because a lot of institutional managers um, are unwilling to speak out on this issue. And the reasons for that are, are, are very simple, which are economic, because if they manage X billion dollars and a percentage of the, that billion dollars is managed by, uh, should we say, the New York State Pension Fund. If you go out and write a hostile comment um, on ESG to the SEC, that is not going to help your business with uh, New York. So I think there is quite a lot of institutional silence on this issue. So the more that people can chip in, um, particularly individual investors, which ultimately the SEC is meant to be protecting, um, to say, no, what, what my interest is my pecuniary interest and my return. If they don't say it, I think the institutions are going to be slow to say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'll just add in a couple things. Um, active investors, that's right, are super important because BlackRock and the other passive investors, they have an outsized role. But again, they're, invest, they're, they're using other people's money for their own activism and then they're you know, writing in comments to promote themselves and promote you know, ESG type investing. And so active individual investors are super important. Thank you for the question, Mr. Conti. And again, the imbalance needs to be noted here, right? We can look back to NASDAQ's proposed board diversity rule. And the, the, for those who don't know, NASDAQ has proposed as an SRO, as a self-regulatory organization, proposed a rule whereby they're going to delist any company on their exchange that doesn't have two diverse board members. Well, the numbers in favor of that rule were like 20 to one uh, when it came to the comment period at the SEC. And so this new rulemaking that again, Jennifer is predicting somewhere around October, uh, when they finally come down with the proposed rule, there needs to be a better balance of the comments. Um, and I love the idea of crowdsourcing to the crowd, it's great. Sort of following up on this, we have uh, another, I think, really interesting question. And, uh, and Justin, I think this is maybe in your, uh, at least to begin with, area of expertise. 
uh, are there any funds for investors who want to avoid E and S as much as possible? In other words, people who say we want you to comply with all applicable laws in the area of environment or discrimination, uh, but within those constraints, your job is just to maximize profits. I know uh, as a lot of people we know have, uh, some of them would have called them anti ESG funds, but those are, <laughs> we won't say anything, this is, none of these things are anti uh, anything, but they are uh, different definitions of what constitutes responsible investment, including from people with, you know, right of center cultural values or, or whatever subset it might be. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is, it, it's a new field um, uh, and I'm glad it's burgeoning, but second vote ETFs, I encourage vo folks to look them up. Um, they have decided that they are going to it, set up ETFs around companies that aren't going super woke on the ESG front. Um, and I, I think that there's a space for a lot more of these funds. They have two of them out right now. One is focused more on social value conservatism and one is focused on defending the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms. And they have more that are rolling out later this year. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a new field um, and it's ripe for opportunity, frankly, because the, 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 the woke ESG crowd has been thundering so, so loudly that there is a space for folks who say, hey, I just want my money to, I don't know, make money. Well, yeah, I, so there are, uh, again, a handful of other firms. I think Inspire uh, is another one of those that has a couple uh, themed ETFs out there. Um, there is just like, uh, there is uh, socially responsible investing, which is what a lot of people, the term people apply to a lot of the same ideas as they uh, apply to ESG today. Uh, there's also a, uh, a subset of uh, biblically responsible investing, uh, BRI, uh, that uh, is at play there. Um, and of course, outside the realm of the United States, uh, there are uh, uh, Islamic funds as well. Uh, Islamic finance is its own uh, special sort of subset theoretically developed uh, which, you know, 50 years ago, probably not that many people paid attention to, but with the rise of the Gulf states there uh, as uh, uh, and a place like Dubai is a big international uh, financial hub. Uh, that is also an aspect. And uh, I, I believe BlackRock has at least one Islamic themed uh, fund themselves. Um, so one of the, and this is reflected in some of the, the questions we're getting as well. Um, the, the idea is that uh, there's no really good hard definition for what ESG means. And so, uh, you know, the sort of subtext here is that uh, people with left-wing political beliefs have defined it to mean one thing uh, and can't people with a different perspective essentially define it to mean something else uh, that's uh, more amenable to what we think a reasonable investment theory is. Um, the, the answer is that's in a way what we're doing right now. Um, but the question is uh, who gets to hold the reins? So one of the reasons why we're talking so much about the SEC is that if the SEC decides for everyone else what ESG means, then it will only mean that one thing. Um, but if it means, well, how do you feel about environmental, social, and governance topics? Well, reasonable people can disagree on any of those subtopics. Um, so that's why we want a competitive market. We want a competitive market for firms, but we also want a competitive market for ideas and concepts like this. So uh, that is, that's where I think sort of two, two important things come together. Um, I don't know if uh, either of our panelists have, have interest in, uh, and want to answer that question about um, uh, other ESG philosophies or com competing ideas of what ESG is. I mean, I, I think that there, there's a role for, uh, I mean, you, you just listed, um, uh, you know, the, the, those that, for example, you know, an ETF round, the, which, where, where the Second Amendment is valued or, or Islamic style or biblical or, or whatever. But I, I, I think there is a, a role for the negative, which is just to say, um, we're not going to be uh, governed by anything other than shareholder return. And um, uh, for myself, I, if, if I look at a company and I see a whole lot of uh, woke stuff, um, I, I, begin to, I begin to wonder, well, is this, is this a company that I want to invest in? And it's not a matter of it being woke or not woke, although I'm not exactly a fan of woke, is that I just think companies to, should stick to their knitting, 
And what is, what is their job? They've been entrusted with shareholders' money and they have to, uh, you know, on a risk-adjusted basis, they have to maximize the return, which does not mean that they have to behave like Genghis Khan, because if they behave like Genghis Khan, they probably won't maximize their return. But if they are trying to introduce things like, for example, reimburse managers, uh, which we're now seeing in bonuses and things like that, or for meeting certain standards, whether they be environmental or diversity or so on, for me as an investor, that would be a, uh, a strike against the company. And so just a statement of the negative will be welcome. We, we, all we're doing is looking after the shareholder. Yeah, and I'll just add in there, I think the competitive market here is good. There's been a lot of innovation in ESG funds, generally speaking, but there's been a lot of innovation in opportunities for investors to invest how they would like. Having the SEC step in here and sort of pick winners and losers is, is problematic. Um, and I also want to jump in and say, you know, I think one of the threads that's been difficult to unravel here is, is the concept that we're talking about now, investing based on social interest or cause interest is not new. Um, this is a, an investment style or an investment strategy that's existed for decades, um, socially responsible investing, however you wanted to call it. We've been having this conversation um, since the 70s and before about people being able to make decisions about what they want to do with their money. What's changed a bit is the way that the proponents of this investing style have, have changed their pitch. It used to be if you wanted to invest in a socially responsible way, whatever, however you define that, you were generally understood that you were going to take some hit in returns for that, um, that there would be a trade-off to your, your investment decision-making. And you were okay with that because it is an investor, you made that decision. But now proponents of ESG investing claim that you don't have to make a trade-off, that, that investing wisely in ESG is a profit maximizing opportunity. And I'm not sure that the research shows that out in any sort of broad based way. And this conversation has gotten muddied because we're, we're not talking about ES and G as Again, I want to put G to the side. We're not talking about E and S as investor choice about the way they would like their companies to behave. People are now talking about it as a way to actually maximize profits. And I don't think that's the right way to be talking about it at this point. Yes, I, you know, I agree that that is something that, that really has become very muddy that I try to, uh, to discuss in, uh, in my own paper. Um, the, the move from you know, what people would call a concessionary approach, which is you, you in effect are, are giving away some increment of the profit you would normally get because you want to uphold your beliefs that you shouldn't invest in tobacco or you know, uh, defense contractors or whatever. Um, you know, that was very much the expectation uh, for decades. Uh, and, you know, but now in the new era of uh, ostensibly non-concessionary ESG investing, uh, there's supposed to be no trade-off at all. And the, the research on this is, is certainly mixed in uh, uh, journals, uh, but I think the one, the main reason why there hasn't, the research hasn't been more negative in the sense of uh, saying that like, yes, it is a concessionary investment. Yes, you will lose some small percent of what you would otherwise have gotten if you invest in quote ESG uh, reliant funds. Uh, is that the definitions are so loose, you don't have to commit to anything in order to be classified as ESG compliant. Uh, so the problem is, you know, you know, what I see the sort of process going forward is you have these, you know, extremely loose, vague definitions. Uh, therefore, you have research that says, oh, well, you're not giving up any returns in order to, to follow this path. Um, but then once you start following the path, you get things like mandatory SEC rules, and all of a sudden, the costs start increasing, um, but at that point, there's no, there's no, there's no going back because they, they've created the severe tire damage spikes behind you, so you can't, you can't back up, um, you know, regulatory and legal ones. Um, but, uh, but speaking of speaking of uh, legal standards, since we uh, do have some, uh, some some brilliant legal minds with us today, uh, we have another question uh, from uh, our viewers. Uh, what are the chances for successful legal challenges 
to future SEC ESG uh, regulation. Uh, and so I'll just quickly say, uh, you know, one of the things that popped up in a lot of these comments was that the SEC uh, in what it's considering doing, again, we don't have a proposal, so we can't uh, like hold it to a standard yet, but uh, based on the questions themselves suggested where the SEC was planning on going, um, a lot of comment, a lot of people who wrote comment letters uh, said, it looks like the SEC might be stepping outside of its boundaries here, doing things that even are not authorized by the uh, by its original statutes from the thirties um, and you know just going beyond traditional practice and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so off the top of my head, that would be uh, something that uh, seems like it could be the basis for uh, a challenge depending on how far the actual rules that they, they publish end up going. But uh, if any of our panelists would like to, to weigh in on what a possible uh, challenge, federal court challenge could be like to, uh, if we imagine that uh, uh, future, the, the SEC climate rules we're looking at or future ESG rules um, end up being very expansive. Well, I mean, the 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 uh, tr traditionally, I mean, I don't as for going against the SEC. I think that'll just be a question of what's in, within their remit and what is not. And um, I wouldn't claim to be uh, an ex uh, an expert on that. Uh, I think one one avenue of legal approach is to go against the companies themselves or against the asset managers. Um, are they uh, doing what they're meant to be doing? And if, for example, we have companies um, disposing of our assets in order to get a higher ESG score, but disposing of them too cheaply, can, can there be, a, is that a, a possible avenue of legal attack? Maybe, but one has to realize that generally the courts are very, very unwilling to substitute their judgment for the, the uh, directors. I mean, it's, it's, it's an uphill struggle, I would say. I would say it's it's difficult without having a proposal in front of us right now to to kind of opine on whether there can be a successful challenge. But I think that there's a lot of potential avenues for challenge, depending on what those proposals end up looking like. And Richard mentioned one. Uh, there's also concerns with um, First Amendment, uh, depending on how broad those disclosures are and the types of disclosures that they, they are. This would be compelled speech by the SEC for, um, for companies. So the, the First Amendment is something that the SEC needs to keep in mind here and that the SEC ran into problems with um, in other disclosures, um, the conflict minerals rule. Uh, and I also, I'll, I'll put in another plug for the, the comment letter space to the extent that the SEC has a comment file that raises issues that the SEC ultimately does not take into consideration properly. Um, a weight of investors who are not interested in this, a weight of investors who don't feel that it's, it's material. Um, that's another potential avenue for challenge of the rule for failing to um, properly consider the um, information received from the public in the notice and comment process. Say it, it's, we're, we're premature to say if anything's going to stick here, but I think there will undoubtedly be litigation um, when the SEC finalizes rules in this space. Yeah, to pick up on Jennifer's point and to, to you know, put a fine pin on it, the, it, the notice and comment period is part of the record, right? So this is where you can tease out potential legal theories in and of themselves. Um, and that's why it's so important to, to get those in um, and to, again, have a balance because if there's an imbalance and the SEC and Gary Gensler and Heron Lee can just say, look, this is what the investors want because the left floods the comment period with pro ESG comments and we're silent, that's going to be a big problem. Um, and it's going to be hard to make harder to make that argument going forward. And I, I think to Andrew's point, which is a separate point, um, we do need to start. The business judgment rule is very difficult to overcome. Absolutely. Uh, when it comes to uh, corporate managers and directors, they have, you know, wide latitude in, in what they can do without a court uh, instituting their own judgment. But that doesn't mean in this new era of extreme um, woke capital where uh, decisions are being made that just seem so out of bounds. I, I think of companies canceling their own clients, you know, Bank of America canceling their own gun clients. That seems to me a direct loss of money that you can put on Brian Moynihan's feet. 
right? So I think that conservatives need to stop being so bashful and to start filing more and more shareholder derivative lawsuits against these, you know, woke directors and woke CEOs um, to try and, you know, A, they'll bring some more attention to the issue, but B, we can really start poking some more holes in the business judgment rule uh, precedent, I believe. Great. Now, we have a, a, a great queue of questions. And again, keep, uh, keep submitting those questions. Thank you so much uh, to our viewers. Uh, here's a question uh, at the, the top of my list, but also it uh, hooks up really well with uh, one of the questions I had already had uh, in advance. So uh, Monroe uh, Lanier asks us, uh, can you assess how much is the e in the ESG push is an effort to increase stakeholder theory in general and how much is an effort to use that approach to force left-wing policies and government control onto corporate private equity and venture uh, sectors? Uh, and I would say, I would, uh, hook that up with uh, the question I was going to direct to Jennifer, uh, which uh, goes back to uh, her submission to that uh, March 15th SEC uh, question list, where you said that uh, you're concerned that prescriptive disclosures in this area are aimed more at altering company and investor behavior rather than providing material information to market participants. And so I think this really gets the heart of uh, why we think ESG theory uh, is or could be a, a threat to uh, property rights and uh, expression and association rights, as Jennifer alluded to. Um, how much of the motivation behind this uh, is getting companies to disclose information as they have always traditionally done and as the SEC has been in charge of getting them to do, uh, and how much of it is, is sort of a feint to get these entities to adopt specific values and policy goals? I'll go ahead and take that. Um, it's hard to draw the line. But I think that there have certainly been people on the left that are ESG proponents who have made clear that this is not just a disclosure issue, that they're interested in using this information and having this information disclosed in order to change behavior, um, that climate finance is at the tip of climate policy these days. Um, some of that uh, is, is papered over by saying that we're not appropriate, appropriately um, measuring climate risk, so assets are mispriced. Um, again, I think there's a lot of debate about that in, in the academic literature as to whether or not that's true. But I think that proponents here don't care that that's necessarily true. Um, they're looking towards changing behavior, be it through name and shame behavior, be it through, um, or name and shame disclosures, be it through uh, just interest in having information out there and highlighting that information as important and something that investors should be looking at, whether they would be on their own or not. So I do think that this is a push to change behavior and not just to correctly price assets. Um, I think it's interesting and I, perhaps I've missed it because I spend most of my time in the financial news, but we've seen a little out of the Biden administration as to actual environmental policy proposals, but we've seen a lot out of the Biden administration as to climate finance proposals. So there's, there's an obvious substitution happening here. Um, and I think it would be um, remiss not to look at it in that vein. Yeah, I, I think we can look at what's already happening, right? The ESG surveys that um, companies respond to and by the way, large companies these days have entire departments that that's their whole job is responding to ESG surveys and questionnaires they're getting from outside organizations. Well, those surveys then go into, you know, rating systems, right? And if they don't change the survey every year, then what's the point? So they, they get a marker in year one and you can look at the, the shareholder activists in the e-space, right? A couple of years ago, they were filing proposals demanding that companies commit to carbon neutrality by 2050. Then it was 2045, then it was 2040, then it's 2035. So the point is to, to set a mark and then change that mark to change the behavior. Um, and you can see this throughout the ESNG space, to be quite frank, um, is once you, once, you get the, once you get the company to commit to X, then you have to commit to Y, then you have to commit to Z, and then you get to start all over again. Um, that, and that would be my guess is where the, if the SEC starts sticking their 
their thumb in it with an ESG rulemaking, it's not going to stay stagnant. I'm sure. I'm sure. That, I'm sure that is right. And, but just to go back to something that um, Jennifer said, uh, which was uh, the reference to the the how, if if you if you like, the attack on climate finance is the tip of the spear, and how that this is in a way being used. It's in lieu of a a more democratically respectable um, approach to dealing with this problem. Um, if it, you know, to the extent to the degree it is a problem, um, I think that that is absolutely deliberate. That they are trying to bypass the normal democratic controls. What is the direction we want society to be going in? I mean, if we don't, if if we don't want um, people to build, uh, to, to 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 be drilling for oil or uh, opening new, um, you know, fracking facilities, well, then then let's pass a law. Um, but what we're doing is trying to increase their cost of capital indirectly by, by basically regulatory and also the investor pressure. And that investor pressure, again, is a few giant investors are the ones that could really drive in. And, I, and I, that's why I keep harping on about democracy here. Yes, thank you, Andrew. And uh, I would uh, uh, double down on that, actually, because uh, we've seen one of the things that climate activists in general, I think, are are very good at are, are trying to uh, convince people uh, that uh, they are inevitable, much like uh, Thanos in the, uh, the Marvel movie, who says, I am inevitable. Uh, uh, climate activists have for decades now in insisted that their path is inevitable. It's decarbonization or uh, any other sort of uh, you know energy sector regulation, uh, and at least in the United States, um, they have not been uh, very successful. Um, you know, the U.S. did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Um, there were a series of uh, controversial, uh, you know, not hotly debated uh, climate acts uh, that were co-sponsored by uh, Senator John McCain and at the time Senator Lieberman um, and a few others. Uh, there were uh, three different, you know, introduced in three different Congresses. All of those uh, failed to pass. Uh, the uh, Obama administration did enact uh, the Clean Power Plan, but it was uh, repealed by uh, the Trump administration, replaced uh, with another rule, um, all of which involved lots of federal litigation, of course, along the way. Um, also, in places where uh, carbon taxes have been adopted, in places like uh, you know, California and Australia, they've either been extremely unpopular or simply have been repealed. So, you know, the, the principles for responsible investment, for example, the UN affiliated organization that publishes a lot of these sort of responsible investing uh, guidelines, you know, ESG type guidelines. Um, they have what they call the IPR, the inevitable policy response. And that is, even if nothing's happened yet, even if your Congress or your parliament or, or your country has not passed uh, severe restrictions on, on carbon fuels yet, um, it's inevitable. It's, it's right there in the name. Um, and so every, every company, for example, every firm needs to price in this future risk of policy, not the future of changing weather, but the future of policy about climate. Um, and that it is, they claim inevitable, but I think the track record on such policies actually being adopted and enforced, you know, the EU to the side uh, globally is not nearly as uh, unstoppable as they would uh, suggest. Um, as we are uh, moving, we are hurtling towards uh, the uh, the end of our allotted hour, uh, and we have uh, many great questions, uh, many more than we have time to answer in detail, certainly with comment from all of our panelists. So I will try to uh, skip through a few uh, quickly and give uh, some answers to, uh, and of course, your our panelists are welcome to, to chime in additionally. Uh, any one of these strikes you is uh, particularly uh, comment worthy. Uh, uh, some people would like more uh, detailed instructions on how to submit public comments. So for, uh, as I said, there's sort of, most public comments are, uh, are pursuant to a proposal where an agency proposes something specific and then we're commenting on it. The, the SEC one was a little bit different uh, because there is no proposal to comment on. Uh, but for, for any of these, if you know an agency is doing anything, you can go to their website uh, and there will be uh, news alerts and recent uh, posts uh, that will link you to the place where you can submit comments. Um, if uh, you are interested in just making sure you get your uh, your eyes dotted, 
uh, you can always uh, contact uh, the people at uh, these organizations, certainly me. Um, and uh, if you if you have a question about like, what's the SEC doing? I heard something about something. Feel free to email me at richard.morrison at cei.org. Uh, I will help you out. Uh, you can also always uh, follow and uh, subscribe to uh, newsletters from organizations like uh, like Cato, like NCPPR, uh, and like myself, and, uh, and like CEI. Uh, in the case of CEI, you can go to cei.org slash newsletters. We have a weekly newsletter called The Bulletin and a uh, monthly newsletter called Great Capitalism, which uh, I am the editor of. And of course, always, at least once a day, go to National Review's Capital Matters and see what they're doing there. Um, so that covers a couple of them. Uh, could woke capitalism with its emphasis on social goals rather than building shareholder value result in more companies going private? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, my colleague, John Burlow, has done a lot of great work on this, um, going all the way back to the additional restrictions placed on public companies by Dodd-Frank um, and the expense associated with, you know, complying with rules by the uh, public, county, uh, public company accounting oversight board. Um, we're already seeing fewer companies go uh, go public. Um, and the, the companies that do go public, uh, go public at a much higher valuation. So you, you've got to be, you've got to be a billion dollar giant before it even makes sense to go public anymore. A lot of uh, some of the most famous companies and ones that we think are very successful today went uh, public at much lower valuations. Uh, you know, Bernie Marcus of Home Depot has said that he could have never have taken Home Depot public in today's environment, for example. Um, so I think uh, not only could that happen, I think it's already happening for sort of similar parallel reasons. Um, Can I jump in on that one, Richard? Yeah, please do. Um, say something just to keep an eye on as we move through this. Um, that is not something that's escaped ESG proponents' um, attention. There has been talk in one of the questions the SEC asked was whether or not they should impose ESG disclosure requirements on private companies, um, which would be a, a massive change in the way that the, ESG, the way that the SEC's disclosure regime currently works. But there's also been hand in hand talk about whether they should be lowering thresholds as to which um, large companies become reporting companies, whether they've done an, an initial public offering or not. So this is potentially another space for SEC action down the line. Um, if it turns out that ESG disclosure requirements are causing companies to stay private longer. So it, just another batter, battlefield here <laughs> um, that's worth keeping an eye on. If I could add just very quickly, uh, really backing up there what Jennifer has said, which I think is absolutely right, because another thing, another reason for them to do that is what you're going to find is when companies sell so-called stranded assets, i.e. they're forced to sell, um, you know, in order to comply with ESG, they have to sell an oil field, say. The best vehicle actually probably to buy that, if it's not a, a, a say, a Chinese enterprise, is in fact a private company. And you are beginning to see private companies take up these unpopular assets. And I'm sure that's driving the SEC quite mad. And just to jump in one more area right there that that made me think of is that another way to get at requiring private companies to disclose um, ESG metrics is through regulation of private equity or other um, private funds, which is also potentially on the SEC's agenda. Um, so the folks that are proponents of this have been thinking about these angles as well. Um, so people that are not in favor should also be thinking about these angles. Right, and uh, just one uh, final one here, and this is something that could uh, we could do an entire event itself on. So this is going to be very cursory. Uh, but uh, Nathaniel Sullivan asks uh, uh, concerns about ESG regulations and the potential for those feeding cronyism. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, any new uh, complex set of uh, rules and requirements. Uh, like the ones that we are uh, imagining might be coming from the SEC or <coughs> there are <clears throat> of course, other federal, uh, finance regulators in this country, uh, so many, I think there's a new one uh, uh, every few months. Uh, yes, uh, we all know uh, about the history of uh, Solyndra and how uh, it was famously going to provide uh, thousands of uh, unexportable clean energy jobs. That was a big thing uh, when the Obama administration uh, unveiled at a, you know, at a big event, the uh, federal loan guarantees for solar panel maker Solyndra, the company which later famously uh, went bankrupt. Um, there are, I mean, just like if any, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, of these to the extent that there are any privileges extended as opposed to responsibilities demanded uh, by government policy, uh, it seems more likely than not that those will be distributed in a uh, crony adjacent way. Um, as of now, uh, what we're just what we're looking at are uh, demands that federal regulators are likely making on firms, um, but it would not at all surprise me um, if we get to the point where privileges and immunities are handed out, even if they are not cash-based, uh, that can be made, uh, end up becoming very valuable going forward. So uh, I wanna thank everyone for uh, submitting uh, questions. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, get a chance to get to every single one, um, but I think some of them are probably things I'll write things about in the future. So uh, thank you. We wanna do a really quick uh, rapid fire uh, roundup where uh, uh, everyone can give uh, a minute or two closing statement. Um, and uh, tie, tie all this stuff together. Uh, Andrew, do you want to start? Well, it's hard to tie it. I think it's been, been a great discussion and, uh, and thank you very much for all who participated. Um, I think that, the, the, you know, the impression I was, was, was I was pessimistic uh, to begin with and I'm pessimistic at the end of it, but I think that uh, one, of few, one or two things that, that have emerged in the course of the discussions, firstly, we all know this isn't going away, but there are things that can be done to push back. Uh, whether it's submitting comments to the SEC and, and maybe beginning a more aggressive legal uh, attack on what these companies are actually doing. So there are things that can be done and, and should be done. Jennifer? Yeah, I agree with Andrew. And I think that um, what we've also talked a lot about today is that there's a lot of what I refer to as mushiness in the discussion of what ESG is, in the discussion of what the disclosures might look like. And it's important as people are thinking through these issues to seize on places where, where there's a lack of clarity. It's very hard to have a policy discussion when we either don't have evidence to back things up because the questions haven't been asked correctly, or that evidence is based on a squishy, difficult to define set of variables. And I think this area can really benefit from some, some rigorous analysis and rigorous thought. Um, and I hope that we can all bring that to bear as we, as we continue to work through these issues, because I think as Andrew said, and as we've all recognized, this, this is not going away. Um, this is going to be a discussion we're going to be having for, for a long time. Thank you, Jennifer. Justin? Thanks, Richard, and, and thanks, CEI, and thanks, everybody who participated. Um, I, I think that to, to kind of have a few wrap-up comments, um, ESG is liberal social engineering at the investment level and passive funds have an outsized role in this. So my, my imploring is for individual investors to pay attention to this because you're the ones who are gonna be harmed the most. Um, ESG is a cost of doing business. Uh, if the SEC and the government gets involved in this, it's gonna increase the cost uh, for, for the companies and decrease your investments. So. Investors need to speak up. They need to contact the corporations that have gone down this path. They need to be engaged wherever the government's going to get involved because the passive investors and the left-wing activist investors that want to change corporate behavior, they're getting louder, not quieter. So you need to speak up. Excellent. And uh, in, a, in an era of uh, uh, perhaps less optimism about democracy than it sometimes uh, you you can still uh, call your member of Congress. I would uh, 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 call and write uh, your uh, your representative, uh, your senators, especially if they're on the banking committee. <laughs> um, but uh, legislative offices uh, do in fact uh, respond to, at the very least, uh, log uh, uh, pro and anti uh, comments about uh, hot hot topic issues like this. So. Uh, uh, don't, don't sleep on that, as the kids say. Uh, I would like to uh, thank our uh, panelists and our audience for uh, joining today. And uh, I would encourage uh, everyone who is watching uh, to uh, stay, stay online and uh, take the one minute survey uh, that will pop up on your screen as soon as the broadcast is done. It's, uh, it's very brief, uh, but uh, it is very useful for us. And we very much do uh, take 
uh, your suggestions into account when it comes to how we do our events, uh, how we uh, plan our series. So uh, that would be uh, very useful for us. Um, and we're coming in uh, just on time, my favorite thing ever. Um, so thanks again, everyone. And uh, we will uh, see you at uh, our next event.